Welcome back to the Soul Forum, the Soul Foundation's uh, monthly digital meeting space for discussion of the science, politics, culture, and philosophy of UAP. So Avi, thanks for um, uh, doing the dual interview with Representative uh, Luna. We know it's uh, uh, not easy to uh, uh, interview with another person, um, but we think we had a good conversation there. Now, before we get into your recent research, I want to you know, talk to you about what's going on in Congress. You and I have had a lot of uh, discussions about um, uh, testimony about uh, U.S. government UAP secrecy. And, I, you know, in the time that I've known you, I've seen you become more open on the subject, even though you're very circumspect. Where, where are you right now about some of these specific claims and, and allegations? Yeah, uh, I'm uh, sort of uh, torn between two narratives that I hear. When I was uh, briefing Congress, in fact, meeting with uh, Congresswoman uh, Luna back uh, on May 1st, the day before that, I visited the Aero, the Old Domain Anomaly Resolution Office. They invited me and I asked them, frankly, I said, did you see anything unusual in the by studying the reports of the past? And they said, no, not really. And then I asked, are you sure that you have access uh, to all information within government, uh, including classified, highly classified information? And they said, yes, definitely. Uh, and a day later, you know, in Congress, I heard the uh, other views. Um, and uh, uh, so uh, to me, it's just a question of direct evidence. Okay. And if the government has materials or information that indicates uh, uh, production, technological artifacts uh, that are not human made, I would love to see those and help government figure them out. Uh, and because uh, scientifically speaking, it will change everything. Uh, it, it will uh, uh, imply that there might be a smarter kid on our cosmic block, which would not be surprising. If you read the news every day, there is a lot of room for improvement. You know, we definitely are not the pinnacle of uh, intelligence. Um, but um, uh, moreover, it will change our perspective about what we want to do. I hope it will bring humanity to a cooperative uh, mode because as of now, we invest most of our resources, you know, $2.4 trillion a year uh, in conflicts and uh, military budgets. And uh, perhaps, it, uh, you know, once we realize that we are all in the same boat because there is, we have a neighbor, okay, so we are all part of the same family, um, uh, then perhaps we will work together. And if we use just a fraction of that budget to space exploration, I think within uh, this century, we can establish a space platform on which uh, humans can travel long distance. And uh, uh, that's, to, in my view, is a much more uplifting vision than going to Mars. You know, going to Mars, uh, it's just another rock, which is actually much worse than the rock we are on because it doesn't have an atmosphere. It's a desert. Uh, the, the conditions change by hundreds of degrees between day and night. You are exposed to cosmic rays that can damage your body within a few years. You might be dead. Uh, so why would we go to another rock? Why not build our own space platform that can support life as we know it and uh, much better? So, um, uh, you know, we went all the way from the jungles of Africa to high rises in, in cities. Uh, that was a huge transition. And going to space is, is it a more minor transition. Uh, if we start in high rises in cities and just uh, build the uh, you know the same habitat out there, um, so uh, in my view this is a very important transformation and it's the next step uh, of humanity. You know people talk a lot about AI, artificial intelligence, but you know it really doesn't touch uh, the, the important facets of our existence and, and, and the question is what is the meaning of our existence what do we want to accomplish and obviously we want um, to maintain the longevity of humanity and there would be a lot of catastrophes in the fu future of the earth we know that because it happened in the past and uh, if we want to preserve uh, humanity we might uh, put the people on a space platform you know and and uh, one way to get inspired to do that is if we see our neighbors uh, doing that, you know, and so I think we should be open to the possibility that we can learn something. We, we need a sense of humility, modesty uh, that is missing. Uh, uh, be, uh, and one way to receive that sense is to realize that uh, there is superhuman intelligence out there. There is something better than us and it could give us inspiration. It could serve as a role model for us. So I see, you know, I see it as a huge impact 
on the way we think, on science in particular, because it can reveal uh, science and technology that we don't possess, because we just had a hundred years since quantum mechanics was discovered. I was actually at the Niels Bohr Institute just uh, last week, uh, visiting uh, at a conference. And uh, I remember the photograph from 1930 uh, of an auditorium there at a conference that was held at the Niels Bohr Institute. And Niels Bohr was sitting next to Werner Heisenberg, Wolfgang Pauli, and uh, uh, Lev Landau. And uh, I entered the same auditorium, it looked familiar, and I sat on the wooden bench and someone told me, oh, you are just sitting exactly at the seat where Wolfgang Pauli sat uh, 95 years ago. Uh, and all I could think at that time was uh, this wooden bench is not very comfortable. You know, they didn't have uh, a quality of life that we have today, but I would trade everything to go back in time, 95 years to the same auditorium because the spirit of physicists back then was exploratory. You know, they were open to uh, uh, changing their uh, perception of reality when quantum mechanics was discovered. Uh, they were open-minded, they uh, went against uh, dogmatic thinking, and we very much need that in academia now. And I really enjoyed the conference that I attended last week because uh, it was open-minded. And I spoke about 3i Atlas, and uh, there was a Nobel laureate, uh, David Gross, that asked me a lot of questions. That's the way science should be done. We should be curious about anomalies, because they may represent something beyond our current knowledge. Uh, Avi, you're you're an incredible you're incredible at rhetoric because I think uh, you put about seven things on the table in uh, three minutes that I can follow up on while while making it seem like you were just talking about one thing. Um, I want to uh, so I want to uh, unpack some of this and and uh, take out some threads and follow them. Um, you know it 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 almost sounds like a cliche to say that uh, dogmatism, uh, closed-mindedness, um, a lack of curiosity are um, uh, common in academia today, but I, I do think that's true. And what, what surprises me, not only about the UAP topic, but um, some of the things taking place with uh, the search for technosignatures and biosignatures is that um, you know the latter two things shouldn't be controversial at all uh, scientifically um, as as basic you know hypotheses or premises that those things um, could be detectable and and out there, um, and yet we know it's been a fight over the last ten years uh, for for people like yourself to do um, study in that direction uh, at all. Yeah. So uh, you know I want to tie that thought to um, again what. I was asking about a moment ago, which is um, the the allegations about um, UAK, UAP secrecy and, and UAP knowledge in the U.S. government. I mean, let's say um, uh, that there indeed is something like, you know, let's just speak hypothetically instead of talking about the testimony, you know, just a component of something from an interstellar craft, you know, a, a, a two foot by two foot box or something with, uh, yeah. you know, but but a uh, unknown. By the way, I, I can immediately I can immediately verify that it's interstellar. That's straightforward because the same technique that we apply to the materials that we retrieved in the Pacific Ocean of an interstellar meteor potentially, with the same approach, can be taken here. We can, uh, if we just have a gram of material, not much, we can immediately tell the abundance of isotopes the chemical composition, and we can demonstrate, uh, you know, if this material came from outside the solar system, that it's not, it was not part of the solar system. That's straightforward. It would take me only a few months to figure this out. Um, and then once we realize the material that makes such an object is from outside the solar system, then, you know, we can ask what, what does it, what does the object mean and uh, what kind of technology it carried. Um, well, I, let me, I, if I may, let me follow up on that. I mean, uh, you know, let's say that, that, you know, suddenly we had some acknowledgement uh, about this from the U.S. government. Um, what, what would you do as a prominent scientist with a Harvard position, um, able to marshal uh, the best scientific resources, capital, you have ties to government? Um, you know, what would your proposal be for um, the plan of attack coming from academia uh, yeah. with private sector support and, uh, uh, and engagement with government? Yes, indeed. Uh, all my research over the past decade was supported by the private sector. I did not apply uh, for government funds uh, to do my uh, innovative research. Uh, 
uh, for a variety of reasons, because uh, the funding agencies are using committees that are populated by mainstream scientists who are resisting uh, innovative research. They live in their echo chamber. Uh, but at the same time, I had a lot of wealthy individuals show up at my home and they provide me with the necessary funds. And I think there is a lot of wealth. The situation is quite different than it was a century ago or uh, 75 years ago when the National Science Foundation was established because now there is a, a layer of society that has uh, enormous wealth. And of course, we hear a lot about their investments in artificial intelligence, but they're also very curious about um, extraterrestrial intelligence. So if uh, we had access to materials or information that is related to that, I think I can easily raise uh, you know, all the money necessary to examine that in full detail. Uh, I have those connections. Uh, and so um, what needs to be done is scientific uh, 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 analysis of um, the information, the, the data, the, the materials uh, uh, that could give us a very clear uh, uh, evidence as to the purpose of this thing, what does it uh, entail. Uh, it, it would be inappropriate to share uh, you know, this information or materials with corporations uh, that are making money, basically, uh, rather than with scientists like myself that are trying to figure it out. You know, money is not the issue for me. Uh, I write, uh, I wrote about Three Eye Atlas, uh, uh, more than 50 essays over the past uh, two months since it was discovered, and uh, uh, they're all offered for free. I, mean, I, I Really, for me, it's just the, uh, uh, trying to figure out nature. That's what motivates me. And I was asked last night uh, if, if uh, you know, we do find the extraterrestrial intelligence and uh, the Nobel Committee in Stockholm calls me in the morning, what would I do? And I said, I will just uh, respond the same way that Bob Dylan did. I will ignore it because the finding itself of extraterrestrial intelligence is far more valuable than any prize awarded by a, a human to a human. Uh, and uh, it's really, uh, uh, you know, if I have limited time on this earth, I would rather dedicate it to figuring out extraterrestrial intelligence if I find it. So altogether, um, it's, um, you know, my priority is figuring out nature. And that's um, uh, what can be done uh, by collecting evidence and studying it. Uh, and uh, what you find right now within academia is resistant to that. And that is a self-fulfilling prophecy in the sense that um, if you are not analyzing data, seeking the evidence, you will never be able to figure out something beyond uh, your current knowledge. Uh, and so when, when people say, uh, you know, this uh, is extraordinary claim that requires extraordinary evidence, what they're actually saying is they're not willing to put time and resources to study it. And th th that means that they will remain ignorant. So humans have this talent of staying ignorant by believing stories that they tell each other. Nowadays, it's on social media. So they tell each other stories within echo chambers, within their tribe, and they don't seek uh, evidence that might prove them wrong. But that's not the way science should, should be done. And, and the only opportunity that we have to learn something new is when there are anomalies, something that doesn't quite line up with what we expected. And I hope, you know, the government has the advantage that it monitors the sky for national security purposes. It monitors the ground as well and the, the oceans, and they may have data that scientists do not have because of that. And they have huge amount of uh, um, resources, you know, instruments and funding, you know, almost a trillion dollars in the defense budget for 2026. Uh, that's a lot of money compared to what science gets. So there is a, a, a reasonable chance that they may have seen things that scientists never witnessed. And they should not hold them away from scientists if they do have them. And I hope they will share them with people like me. Mm -hmm.